democracy. We produce the annual Digital Democracy Report here, which is the occasion for this panel today. We have a list of about 130 digital democracy tools, but we only include about 30 or so of them in the report. So to get in the report, you have to actually be implementing democracy on some level that is actually giving people power. So not just engagement or some kind of vague talk where nothing comes of it, because that's not democracy. And in addition to that, you have to have the ability to survive as an organization, whether that's as a business or some other form of organization and be able to fulfill your contracts and your arrangements with others. Very few things out there fulfill these criteria. And even when we apply them, there are some great tools that come and go because this field is actually quite precarious. And that's where we come in to try to separate the wheat from the chaff. We do examine every tool that goes into this report on quite stringent criteria. So I think we have about 50 criteria or more, and we're always adding to those as our capabilities expand. Because we work voluntarily, our greatest investment is time. We interview people who use these tools, we get access to them and try them out ourselves. We don't really see ourselves as a cheerleading squad for digital democracy, because you can't afford to be if you want things to really work in real life. However, we also think that this is an area that's definitely been under-recognized. And there's also a lot of unjustified criticism and debt. And people claiming that things are impossible when actually they're not only possible, people are already doing them. Like I can't begin to count the times that someone has told me really confidently that something's impossible that I actually did last week on one of these tools. So to recognize this, we also give out awards. Some other organizations have started copying this, um, I should mention. So there's also some organizations that get a lot of money from large foundations and have begun you know, copying basically our system of doing things, which I think is really not cricket, as some of our British friends could say. But we are not part of one of those big funder ecosystems. We're not buddy-buddy with the people we give awards to. If you get an award from us, it's because you deserve it. Because of the location of this year's form in Mexico, we have a lot of winners from the Americas today, and particularly Team Canada is pretty well represented in our panel today. But we are a global organization, and you can view all of our other winners in the report and on our website, which is salonian-institute.com. So we have five categories, inspiration, innovation, inclusion, and impact. And we then also have a Newcomer of the Year Award because we also wanted to recognize that these organizations that are new to being included in the report um, have to quite reach a quite high evidence barrier to satisfy us. We demand evidence for every single thing we award points to, and that can be quite a difficult onboarding process. So that's why we have that fifth category. Today, some of the winners that are here are Civil Space, which has now been incorporated into Zen City. And Zen City is represented here today by Director of Marketing and Partnerships, Asif Francis. And they won our Inclusion Award in 2022 for their translation engine, which is quite a nifty little thing that automatically translates content and then lets you go over it and tweak it. So 20 years ago, I was translating the user view of computer programs one word at a time. So it really shows how far we've come that things like this are available. Othello, which is represented here today by CEO John Richardson, won our Innovation Award for 2022. Othello is technically a very innovative platform, as I'm sure their presentation will attest. But they won the award for continuing to innovate on their use cases of the platform. The great thing about digital technology is that it's very flexible. And you can sometimes think, hey, we could do this or we could do that, which are things that you may not even have thought of when you first invented it. And Othello has continued to expand their range, being used by DAOs, decentralized autonomous organizations, and doing carbon budgeting alongside participatory budgeting, which I'm sure a lot of you will already be aware of. PlaySpeak, represented today by CEO Colleen Hardwick, was our honorable mention in our inspiration category for its seed functionality. This functionality is really interesting because it allows people who are part of a community to express interest in something and then to let that bubble up to government rather than running things the other way around, top down. So the idea is if enough people in an area express interest in an issue, there should be a consultation on that issue. 
And I've long felt that this is a really under-recognized and underutilized way of organizing things. Skyboat, an Italian software, unfortunately could not be here today due to a product launch that was shifted short term at their organization. But you can, of course, find out more about them in a report. So thank you all for coming here today and for sharing your considerable experience with us. I'd also like to especially thank Sam Chang of the Negative Vote Association for jumping in and moderating this panel. I'm sure a lot of you know about Sam and his work from previous conferences, but definitely a very heartfelt thanks from us here. And with that, I'd like to put things in your capable hands and I will fade into the background. Thank you. Thank you, Roslyn. Okay, uh, so next up is um, Asaf Francis from Israel. And uh, I'll let uh, Asaf introduce yourself more if you like. And we have set up this so that uh, each presentation is limited to 10 minutes. So we have uh, as much time for Q&A as possible. Asaf. Zen City. Yes. Yeah, here, there's a, there's not a microphone. Yeah. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, I'll put a timer for myself just to make sure that I stick to it. Uh, thank you very much, Sam, and thank you, uh, everybody, for being here today. My name is Asaf Francis, and as was mentioned, I am originally from Tel Aviv, uh, recently relocated to New York, and I've been with Zen City for, wait, we need to go to a different slide. Hold on. Uh, yeah, so. All right, it's up. Here we go. Um, recently relocated to New York. I'm an urban planner by training, and I currently run the marketing and partnerships team uh, at Zen City. So what do we do? Today I'm going to talk to you about a little bit about inclusive community engagement and everyday uh, democratic practices in civic life. How do we get people involved in the conversation, not just every four or five years when they're uh, required or needed or asked to vote? How do we make sure that they're involved in decision making that affect our everyday life every day? Next, please. So Zen City was founded on the belief and understanding that actually local government is the organization that keeps our world running. It's probably the organization that affects every aspect of your life with you knowing it or not knowing it. This is a pretty well-informed uh, crowd, so I'm sure you guys are aware of that, but from trash pickup to education to keeping your, your parks clean to making sure your kids and yourself feel safe, that's all done by local government. Local government has all these budgets, all these decisions to make. How can we make sure that they make the best decisions with the money that they have? How can we make sure that the decisions that they make actually impact the people that they serve? Um, next, please. So we're currently very proud to serve over 300 local governments uh, uh, around the world. The majority of our clients are in the US, but uh, we work with cities of all sizes, from the city of LA, in California, all the way to the village of Le Mans in Illinois. So really from over uh, 8 million to about 15,000 people across the world. And what we help them do is build trust, and we'll talk about trust in a second, because it's a very important concept here, improve services, and by that, increase satisfaction from services. Next. Building trust. Building trust is essential to, uh, be, for government to be able to continue to work effectively, for them to be able to continue to serve their residents effectively in a day-to-day. -day. And that is success, right? Because at the end of the day, our government, our local governments, our cities, they are measured on how successful, their success is in how satisfied we are, how, well -being, how our well-being is preserved as residents, how safe we feel. Um, and therefore, trust is a major part in, in making sure that success exists. But to build trust, Engagement is very much necessary, right? If decisions are being, are being made in a vacuum, then we have less impact on how those decisions are made. Who here has ever participated in a town hall meeting? If you raise your hand. Great, okay, so three, four, five, six out of the crowd here. Usually it's what you see, right? If you are being called into an into a in-person town hall meeting, usually empty, look at the hours, right? Thursday, August 10th, 10 a.m. to 2.30. Not that many people are able to attend. How do we make sure that we hear beyond what we call the STP, the same 10, 20, 30 people that have the resources, the time, and the ability to come to these sessions? Next. 
So this complex problem requires a multifaceted solution. There's not one way to do community engagement, and by no means we're saying that we should do away with these in-person meetings. Those are very vital, and the hearing from those really engaged residents is critical. But there are other ways. How do we increase that conversation and make sure more people are being involved? So, as we're saying, it's hard to hear and reach beyond the STP for community input and participation, but also it requires significant effort, time, and resources from the local government to continually collect this feedback, right? If we want to, as a local government, get checks and balances on what we're doing, understand if we're on the right track, we need to invest a lot of time and money into continually doing that. How does Zen City help uh, in that respect? Next. So the basic assumption is that we need to meet residents where they are, rather than having them try and come to us. What we're saying is, if we know by now that, for example, in the US, smartphone users check their phone 50 times, 52 times per day, how do we get into their smartphone when we ask them for a decision that we, when we need their input? How do we meet them where they are? How do we find them on social media, on the blogs that they read, and in the places that they're already visiting online? Those, engaged, those engagement town halls that we can find online. Next. So, we make it easier to gather meaningful input by hearing more voices, lowering the, bars, the barriers for participation, again, like I just showed, and easily getting meaningful takeaways. Because just hearing and getting input from hundreds or thousands or as many residents as you are able to engage is nice, but how do you consolidate that into insights? How do you bring in the essence of what residents are actually wanting? What are their needs? What are their priorities? Next. So, our solution provides four different set of tools. One is sentiment analysis. We scrap whatever online conversations are publicly being held online about the city or the county, and we bring that into the platform. We analyze it according to sentiment, negative, positive, or neutral. We run community surveys on a multitude of topics that run continuously rather than every two years. Every quarter, the city gets a report about trash, about safety, about education. What do residents think? Where do they want the money invested? What are their priorities? We have a digital engagement platform, which is civil space. I'll talk about that in a second. And experience survey. Once you've engaged as a resident with the city, you get served a survey through your phone, through the app, uh, not an app, sorry, through, through your number, your phone number, and you get asked a couple of questions. How is the service? How is the engagement? How would you rate it? The city gets that feedback so they continuously improve the service that they're providing. See much time I got. Great, three minutes. Um, can you click next? <clears throat> so how does this 360 approach help um, cities in major projects? So when you start off, you're able to recognize the needs and priorities by listening to the organic conversation that's already being held, or actually just running a survey asking about a specific project that you're trying to, uh, to get off the ground, getting representative surveys, and uh, getting that information all sort of tailored into an insight that you're able to then use into um, the decision-making for the project. You're able to then collaborate to create stakeholdership. So you're using the Engage platform to have a two-way conversation with your residents, get their ideas, get their comments, get questions from them, and are able to then use that into um, how you're planning the, the specific projects that you're running. While you're executing the project, there's conversation online, right? If, you have, if the project, let's say, is a bike lane uh, that you're implementing in a new neighborhood, once it's being built, people are discussing this online, they're talking about it in their social media. Through our uh, organic platform, you're able to see what the sentiment is. Is it being discussed in a negative way, in a positive way? What are the things that are driving that conversation? Um, and you're able to tweak the messaging along the way and perhaps even tweak the projects if needed. And lastly, to measure impact, right? Because at the end of the day, we want to make sure that the projects that we're running as a city impact the right in the right way. So we're using surveys to measure the ability um, <clears throat> sorry, to measure the change and the impact that it had, this had on the quality of life and the well-being of the people that are being served by that specific uh, project. Yes. Uh, I'm not going to go into that because there's not that much time. There's just a minute. Uh, but actually, let me just show you one quick thing. Um, so this is the platform where you can see sort of all the four tools that I mentioned. And here we go. And if you would go, for example, to uh, an example in affordable housing project, we're able to see that uh, through this portal, this is how residents would be able to view it. 
all these questions, all these information. Let's see if this loads up. Um, but they get, they're able to rank specific ways how they want to spend the money, where they want to put the specific housing, what kind of housing they want to see. Um, engage in a two-way conversation, see the timeline of the city in terms of where the project is at, and then submit their, um, their ideas, their, res their responses, their comments. All that is being gathered into the platform. At the end of the day, the city provides a report and is able to then show the residents what kind of input was given, what kind of decisions were made, closing that feedback loop to make sure that residents also know how the input that they were provided has been used or hasn't been used. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I will ask the audience to hold on the questions and uh, we'll have the next presenter. After all the presenters are finished, then we'll start the Q&A session. Next up is uh, John Richardson from Canada. Thank you. So I have a, a PowerPoint lined up. <coughs> Just one moment. It's on. No. It's on. I, I put it on the computer a few minutes ago. I have a browser. He needs to help it. One moment. Have internet access, and I have a web browser. No, I just loaded on the computer this before now. You're on this computer? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Yeah. The question is how did you get 300 local governments to sign up? Um, and we have a great, oops, sorry, we've been around since 2016 and uh, we have a solution that really hits on a challenge because they are trying to get input, they're trying to build trust, they're trying to gain satisfaction from the residents and there were no means to engage the unengaged people who don't want to, you know, show up to a town hall meeting. So, yeah, mm -hmm. we're very persistent. Our sales team is very persistent. <laughs> yeah. Great. So my name is John Richardson. I'm the founder and CEO of Othello. And we are uh, essentially a group decision making platform. So we have a kind of a technology for enabling large groups and sometimes small groups to make complex decisions together. And we began about 11 years ago as a nonprofit organization. And we have a foundation as well as a company that works with cities pretty much all across Canada. We're based in Canada. Um, we've worked with, please. Like, we work with about 150 different cities. Um, we're a B Corps. Um, and um, I think Roslyn mentioned, well, I had the honor of winning this innovation prize this year. Um, next. Okay, I'm just gonna go with this side. So I'll just spend a moment here. I mentioned we've worked with about 150 local governments across Canada, but we also work with other kinds of organizations as well. Um, foundations, uh, we work with the Canadian federal government, political parties, uh, we work with a number of indigenous uh, governments as well, and um, you know, public agencies. In the last couple of years, as Rosalind mentioned, we've also started working with what are called um, Web3 organizations. They're also known as um, DAOs. Uh, distributed autonomous organizations. It's a new kind of entity that is arising out of blockchain technology. It's very interesting. It's not crypto, but the kind of technology that's being used to build crypto is also being used to build these new kind of organizations. And I'll, I'll maybe say a few more words about that because I think it's a very interesting space. So working with a broad variety of different kinds of organizations and many different sizes of groups, sometimes as small as eight or 10, all the way up to, I think our largest process was 10,000. Okay. One of our most popular platforms is called Citizen Budget. So this is a, a we might describe how Othello works as a workflow. People arrive at a web page and they go through a series of um, exercises 
or they no where they can give feedback on for example spending decisions so we've allocated about 10 billion dollars uh, over the past 10 years working with uh, local governments who are doing their annual budgeting processes on the platform and in many provinces in Canada it's mandatory to do some kind of budgeting process to engage the community and sometimes it's as simple as you know the city will post their budget on their website and people can give comments that's the very simple one I think we would probably be at the more advanced end and when the fellow process people can give feedback on many aspects of the budget I'll say a few more words about that we're also used for granting processes or participatory budgeting processes and we've worked with about 150,000 um, decision participants you might say okay so you know one of our clients is the Canadian government and I put this here because I think it's nice, a nice way of describing what the technology does it's a powerful algorithm for decision making plus um, a social media interface for a dialogue and interaction so and really the focus is group decision making okay so here are some of the tools that um, you might find on an Othello decision making process there are different kinds of voting tools sometimes there are sliders where people can move sliders to allocate different amounts of money to different government departments for example um, you know works on a number of different kinds of devices all devices really so when we design a workflow for a city it's usually some combination of different voting technologies and deliberation technologies all designed to enable a certain kind of decision it might be a budgeting decision or a planning decision or a design for a community center or a park usually um, kind of an important decision uh, that has a high value and so great so this I'll spend a few more minutes here so this is really gets at what a fellow does how am I doing for time by the way okay so when you think about a decision you know in a normal democratic voting process usually people are voting for or against some proposition that's put in been put in front of them but all the power is really in what is the proposition that is people are going to be voting on what what do people get to vote on and so you can approach that by thinking well what kind of decision needs to be made here can we break it down what are the different options what are some of the constraints what are the different criteria so we can take a decision and break it down into a kind of a language and people can give feedback on all the different pieces that go into making up the decision and then this algorithm that was mentioned is able to rebuild the decision by looking at all the combinations and permutations of all the different possibilities and sometimes there's a dozen different possible outcomes and sometimes there could be a million different kind of outcomes people don't have to vote on a million outcomes but they can vote on the pieces that go into making up those different outcomes okay next so what it does is for example in a budgeting process you imagine that people can move a slider on all the different amounts of spending in a process and then it will examine all the different scenarios and it tries to find outcomes that will unite a group so in a traditional majority voting process you might have an outcome that looks like the graph at the top there's some people that are really don't like the outcome other people that really love the outcome and a bunch of people in the middle maybe it had a 65 percent or a 60 percent support what the Othello algorithm does is it scans all the thousands or millions of potential outcomes to try and find an outcome where people are roughly similar in how happy they are with the result so it tries to find decision outcomes that are not polarizing in a group so that there aren't winners and losers and because it's looking at so many different possible outcomes it can find these sweet spots these consensus areas and it's quite effective and I'm I, if later on I might have a chance to tell a story about this but exit polls that we do on our process show between 75 and 80 percent of participants would support the decision that 
the Othello platform recommends. So it has a very high uh, support rating from groups. And it's uniting. And I think that's kind of the key idea behind the technology. Can we have a process that identifies an outcome that people think is a fair outcome, where people aren't divided into winners and losers? And unfortunately, the majority vote system that so much of modern democracy relies upon often results in winners and losers. Okay? Oh, last slide. In the past few years, we've also been doing a lot of climate democracy processes. And I mentioned earlier that we do budgeting processes. Well, many cities have made GHG commitments. They're going to hit a GHG target by 2028, 20, 2030. So we do carbon budgeting processes where a city will set its budget, but it's not a financial budget, it's a carbon budget. And people can go through and indicate how much they would like to see um, carbon reduced in different areas. Should we, for example, um, increase the number of bike lanes? Well, that will have a certain amount of impact on carbon emissions. So citizens themselves can participate in these processes and help the city identify where to take action to reduce the carbon budget. And citizens, as they go through, will actually hit the carbon budget. They create their own carbon budget strategy, each person, and then the platform is able to take that input from all of the people that have participated and identify a strategy for the city that will hit the carbon reduction target and also um, appeal to a very broad group of people. That is a kind of a consensus solution for the community. And I think this idea of optimized consensus is a core one. Can we move beyond majority voting to some kind of outcome that represents a broad consensus in the community? And uh, along with carbon budgeting, we also do a number of other kind of climate processes, but I'll leave that for now. In short, the idea is, you know, when we, when we talk about democracy, we have a certain idea about the voting that goes into democracy, and giving people a chance to vote is very important. But it's also important, I think, to consider how many people will be in favor of the outcome. Is it, if it's a 60% outcome, it may be that everyone had an equal vote. But did everyone, is everyone equally happy with the result? And can we have a conception of democracy that thinks about fair distribution of happiness at the result? Right, that everyone has an equal right to happiness with the outcome of the democratic process. And digital technology, I think, makes that possible. So, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Very interesting indeed. So um, next we'll have uh, Colleen, also from Canada, and uh, Colleen, take, take the floor. Hopefully I can remember what I'm saying. Well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Colleen Hardwick. I'm an urban geographer, also uh, academically, also a film producer, a serial entrepreneur until recently, uh, um, a four-year elected city councillor in the city of Vancouver, and I'm also the founder and CEO of, of PlaySpeak. And PlaySpeak was created to solve the problem of, of how to consult with people online within specific geographical boundaries in a provable way. I've got my slides. It's um, PlaySpeak. It's... Do you want to, I really do need my, yeah, that's it. Bingo. Okay. Now, there we are. So, yes, the, the, the title of the presentation is Making It Real Online, and that is really my objective. Next slide, please. So, um, yes, that's me up there, and um, I have recently finished four years on Vancouver City Council, which was a real eye-opener. Um, as I mentioned, PlaySpeak was developed to solve the problem of how to consult with people online geospatially. Um, 
And when I first started down this path, uh, I was fortunate to get the support of the National Research Council of Canada IRAP program, uh, which has continued to support our development as we've iterated the technology and, and uh, used different um, use cases. We are also, like Othello, uh, certified uh, B Corp, Social Pur Purpose Corporation, in light of our, our mission, which is, again, to make democracy real online. Next slide, please. Um, I also re-enrolled with gr in grad school when I started on this project with PlaySpeak as my thesis topic in applied innovation. And part of that was in political science. And I took Mark Warren's grad seminar in political science to anyone that knows Mark's work in Participedia. Um, and I constructed this legitimacy framework. And for those of you that um, are in embedded in democratic theory. Popular control suggests that we elect representatives to represent us, so they need to know what us think in the first place, and we need to know that you're a real person and that you're a constituent. Considered judgment means that we need to be informed and educated so that the feedback that we provide is, is actionable and civil. Inclusivity or inclusiveness, we now know that we can reach more people online than any other way. Transferability is the part that most people don't think about. When you vote, you're on a voters list, you prove it with your ID, you get your ballot, and you cast your ballot in private. Well, so too, are we, should we take the same approach with, uh, if we're allowing uh, civic engagement and public consultation to be influencing our decisions? We need to know that you're a real person, that you're a constituent, and we need to protect your privacy. And we need to be transparent because seeing is believing, notwithstanding deep fakes. Next slide, please. So this is the feedback loop. We're supposed to consult and engage with residents to gather their feedback, which is the data that should be informing our deliberation. If we're, and again, I know this is about uh, direct democracy, but we're still dealing with a, a dis different form right now, and then influence the outcomes. But the truth of the matter, and I can tell you from personal experience, that those decisions, those outcomes, are almost always foregone conclusions. And the consultation process is a marketing exercise designed to manufacture consent. And until we address that, we are not going to be able to solve this problem. So next slide, please. So my analysis said, if you want to stand behind the data, and we believe in evidence-based decision-making, we need to be able to stand behind the veracity of the underlying data. So with PlaySpeak, you have to verify who you are, and at the same time, we need to protect individual privacy. So I came into contact with an organization called the DIAC, the Digital Identity Authentication Council of Canada, and they had already worked on uh, ideas around online proof of residency. I expanded that out to uh, applications in citizen engagement. I was also introduced to the concept of privacy by design, and so our data architecture separates out your private information that you use to verify that you're a real person from the feedback that you provide, and that's essential. Next slide, please. So there's me. I sign up. I verify where I live. I create a profile for myself, not unlike what you would do with your social media profiles. Once we've established where I live, then I can choose to be notified of other consultations according to my preferences by distance, keyword, um, and frequency. I also have now the ability to be able to connect and communicate with my neighbors. And so, uh, in addition to being able to um, respond to consultations at all levels of government, we're dealing with federal, provincial, regional, and local governments, so too am I able to connect with my neighbors. And um, one of the things that we were recognized for earlier was our ability to gather that information and then shoot it back to the city um, in order to show them that there is tangible interest within specific geographical boundaries. Next slide, please. We also modeled this after the IAP2 uh, spectrum of participation because we need to have, uh, we need to be able to afford, inform people, which is considered judgment. We need to be able to gather feedback. We have polls and surveys and we integrate multiple survey platforms. We need to be able to facilitate bi-directional communication through discussions. And I will add that when people verify themselves, they're much better behaved. 
in discussions. Uh, we find ways for people to be collaborating in co-production tools. And finally, um, direct decision making, which is empowerment. And the largest project we've done with the National Research Council is PlaceVote for fully encrypted place-based voting. The trick from a software engineering standpoint is to make democracy habit forming. I keep hearing this question of what do you do to get people engaged and how do you keep them going? That is really the challenge for us as, as software um, entrepreneurs and thought leaders that we need to address. And then once you got people in there, it cross pollinates the network effect and you're able to increase participation, which is ultimately our objective. Next slide, please. So PlaySpeak contains um, a bunch of different tools. You can sort of see them here. Uh, they address each of the areas in the IAP2 spectrum as I described. Um, but all of the data that is collected is dynamically geocoded. So whether we're talking polls or surveys, discussions, notice board, all these tools, when you get to the reporting stage, all of it is, next slide please, transparent. So, all of my data is going to be uh, spatially segmented according to the polygons that you put on the map. But I can see most of our tools have been designed for transparency. So you can see in real time how people are responding. One of the tools that I developed was called a Centimap for spatial visualization of big text data using AI. So that it, it, it attributes colors from red to green to attitudes that are strongly positive to strongly negative. But transparency and trust, again, is mission critical because it's when you can see it, it makes the, the decision makers accountable. Next slide, please. So examples of how this has played out. Um, this is a, one in the states in Elkhart County, Indiana, Indiana where they were um, going to put in a 1,400 unit ICE facility, Immigration Detention Center. And when news got out, um, the proverbial hit the fan and um, the s social media was just a, a, a bloodbath of racist trolls. So they brought it on to PlaySpeak where people had to verify themselves. They geofenced it and said only people within our boundaries can participate. And as a result, they had a very active discussion that was civil, zero trolls. And moreover, when we have tools like this is our poll tool, so not only can you see the responses with percentages percentages and bar charts, you can also see it color coded distributed on the map, which again speaks to transparency, which we believe that kind of visualization is really key to building confidence in the process. Next slide, please. Uh, here's one completely different. This is the Northwest Territories, the city of Yellowknife in Northern, in Northern Canada. You can see a laundry list of all different topics that they've done there. And it, whether they're budgets or off-leash dog parks or First Nations or transit, whatever it is, they attract different audiences. But as people sign up and get into the system, then they can be, nom they can be notified and participate in all different consultations. And so this has addressed the concern about getting the usual suspects all the time because we get a lot of diversity and again, cross-pollinates the network effect and increases participation overall. And then last and, and most recently, um, the town of La Salle out in Ontario recently uh, did a consultation around their budget. They had a very active discussion, as most people are about budgets with inflation right now. And uh, staff had, had suggested that they bring in a budget at five, over 5%. But based on what they the feedback that they received from the public in their their uh, council meeting the week before last, they actually voted uh, to send it back to staff, reflecting the will of the people, and said, "Bring it back to us below five per percent." And place speak when they went and did their council report was specifically recognized uh, for influencing that decision. So, final slide. Um, my dream for this, uh, final slide, is to make, that we can make democracy real online all over the world. If we can authenticate people, and authentication is, is uh, an iterative process, there's no silver bullet, protect their privacy, keep them informed from all levels of government about what's going on, then we're going to give people a real sense that they can have an impact. And that's what it's all about, making it real online.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Colleen. Would you please stay, stay here, and then we, uh, the other panelists, uh, join Colleen uh, behind the desk over there. As we uh, prepare to take uh, go into the Q and A session, uh, I will take advantage of being the moderator and ask the first question that I find that uh, I, I like to learn more from John specifically. Uh, can you? Can you give us an example of uh, what your organization actually did? Uh, you said you had 150, you know, served 150 different organizations. And uh, what, uh, give us an example of what was yeah. successful. Sure. And I will ask Colleen and, and SF to uh, listen to that and say, for, Colleen, you said that the uh, issues of trust, and you said issues of trust, and whether that example uh, addresses the, uh, what Colleen has mentioned, that it was a foregone conclusion, uh, uh, this, you know, some of these the surveys that, uh, uh, that were done online, whatever. Okay, well, um, the example that I'll share, because what we do is kind of complicated to explain, this idea of, you know, scenario analysis and how do you break down a decision. So this story is not actually about a municipal consultation. It's about an engagement that we did for a condominium complex. There's a lot of different housing units in a large building. And they had, um, when they built the complex, they were supposed to, there was a courtyard in the middle of the complex, and it was supposed to have slow, go, slow growing short trees in the courtyard. But unfortunately, uh, they planted uh, fast growing tall trees. And after a few years, the trees grew very high and they started to block windows of people in the second and third floor. And, uh, you know, in these condominium complexes, people can get very emotional about their living conditions. And so there was a fight that broke out about what to do with these trees. The people whose windows were blocked said, they get cut down the trees, get rid of these trees. I paid a lot of money for my view. I want to have my view. And then other people in the complex really like the trees. They're big, beautiful trees. And they, they said, what, do you hate nature? What, what kind of people are you? You know, we love the trees. And so, you know, it just became very black and white. And people were very bitter, <laughs> living with their neighbors and fighting with them. So um, one of the directors of the condominium complex heard about our company. They invited us to see if we could help solve the problem. And this is where we get to play with what is the question, right, that we were voting for. They thought we were going to have a vote. Do we cut the trees or not? But that's not how we approach these problems. We think, well, what are the options that we have? You know, there's, we could do, we could deal with trees that are blocking the window, or we could deal with the trees that are on the south side, which are really growing tall, or we could do something with all the trees. And there are different remedies that we could take. We could replace the trees. We could put bushes in. We could prune the trees. We could just cut the trees down. And how long are we going to do this? They didn't have very much money. So are they going to do it over a period of years? Are they going to do it all at once? So what we did was we created a workflow where people could indicate their level of support to all of these different pieces of the decision. And in this case, there wasn't two outcomes. There was actually 36 outcomes because of all the different ways you could put the pieces together. So, um, we had about 40% participation in the condominium complex, a fair amount of participation. And the recommendation that the Othello platform provided was to just prune the trees in front of the windows of the people that were upset. Okay. So no one has suggested this. Everyone was cut down the trees, save the trees, but there was this middle ground of just pruning the trees that were bothering people and Actually, nobody opposed this. It was second choice for everybody. But everybody was equally unhappy with it. <laughs> you know, everyone could look at it and say, well, I can live with that. So both sides could live with that. And so the condominium owner said, fine, we'll do that. Right? And we circled back a few months later and said, well, how did, how did that happen? Well, how were those results? He said, well, um, we did it and no one said a word. So he said success, right? So 
this is the, this is the power of scenario analysis. You can, instead of having black and white questions, you can go back a little bit and break it down and let the group develop the solution. And it can develop a solution that will have a broad support in the community. So that's an example. Microphone, but uh, I was just wondering what you were saying that uh, there's other solutions that yes and no. And I was thinking, how about making a, a, a similar survey for Ukraine and Russia? Hi, um, I've had a question about um, democracy making it real online. Um, when you say it's um, like a goal to expand it to make it um, like to more regions, uh, the initial um, sense of it is that uh, in those profiles, um, people can get to know ways to participate like locally or um, and then it getting some information locally, but also um, regionally? Yeah, so it's a citizen-centered model. I invite you all to go to PlaySpeak and sign up. You'll still have to go home and, and go through final verification, but it's centered on you. So for example, just while I've been here today, um, Environment and Climate Change Canada just launched a topic about plastics. And that will have gone out to everybody across Canada they will have segmented the country down by province so that when they they get to all their reporting, all of it will reflect what's in each individual province. Now, at the same time, I could get um, I could get a consultation from my local government. From I could have conversations going in my neighborhood. The the point is that once I've been established and my location has been established, it shouldn't matter. Um, all levels of government, and not just go government, we, we are dealing with all different kinds of organizations in, in similar fashion to what John's done with Othello, which I think is brilliant, by the way. The only thing I would add is our, our uh, we have an OAuth2 single sign-on, which is geospatial, which would add the uh, authentic authentication of the individual. But this is the trick. If, if I sign up, just like you, you do with, you, with a Facebook or a, a LinkedIn or something like that, then you're in there, then you should be able to be informed. And similarly, on the other side, when whoever's lining up the consultation, they determine. That example I gave about Elkhart County, Indiana, they geofenced and said only people within our county can participate because this was during the Trump era and immigration was a bit of a hot button topic. And so if they had let it open with all of the harassment that was going on, it would have been completely, like I say, a bloodbath of trolls, but they were able to contain it to their county. Does that help? Hello, uh, thank you. Uh, all of your projects were great, wonderful. And my question is for Ms. Hardwick. And my question is, how did you promote PlaySpeak? Because I kept thinking here in Mexico, uh, people are willing to give everything away in Facebook, right? But if you tell them this is something that the government is probably going to see, they think, oh, my identity is going to be stolen. There are going to be persecution, especially if we, I think uh, because we have certain uh, background where we know it has happened. Yeah. Uh, but how did you promote it so that those people who were scared that they will be, uh, that they were prosecuted? persecuted by the government could be engaged here? That's a really good question. And I have run into that. And we have satisfied every um, rigorous, um, you know, controls that we've went through from all levels of government in Canada, the US, the UK and Australia. Um, so we've, we've had to jump through a lot of hoops to prove that our data architecture does protect individual privacy. 
It does, I promise you. But we don't promote it because we're, this started as a bootstrap startup with a bunch of university students out of my basement. Um, so we just don't have that, that kind of money. So um, whether again, it's in the federal government, the provincial government, the local government, it's their responsibility to get it out there. And, you know, we, we did a bunch of work trying to look for strategies about how to cross promote and social media and, and, you know, online and offline tactics. You need to do all of that to get people in, in the 1st place. But with that example of yellow knife that I gave, and they've been using it, I think, since 2015, um, they have just, because there's been such a wide variety of topics, it's attracted a lot of different people, you know, more. Some people care a lot about off leash dog parks, for example, um, and other people are, you know, some people do actually care about the budget. Uh, it's, although it's hard sometimes to get people to participate in that. But the next wave of what I'm working on my next project with the National Research Council is going to be much more focused on the civic networking side of things um, because. It, it, you know, it's 1 thing to wait for those consultations to come in and another thing to be able to to be talking amongst ourselves. And that was the reason that we created the system for automating place based notifications, which was referred to as as our seed topics. So, if there's open data around rezonings or development permit applications, for example, in a municipality. Um, and it, we've written the code and it's on GitHub. It's open source. Anybody can use it. It plots it on the map notifies people according to their preferences, usually a two block radius. And if a threshold of people say that they're interested in participating, it shoots an email back to the city saying, hello, we want to, we want to talk to you about this. And here's the evidence. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Um, what we try and do with with the local governments that we work with is when we launch a new uh, a new partner, a new client, we encourage them to share the fact that they've start off with Zen City that they will be collecting data that residents share about their city, um, so that residents first of, first and foremost know that what they're putting out there, the city is listening and uh, will be taken into account. And specifically, when we're launching a survey with them. We're encouraging again to to promote the fact that it, that it's that it's taking place, but also to continuously share the results. So, if the if the consultation finished, they'll say that. When the results are being taken to council, they'll say that. And when the results are being implemented into the program that they're trying to promote, we're we're also encouraging them to promote that and uh, on all their social media media channels, public announcements, etc. So the idea is we go back to the concept of the feedback loop to keep residents from informed all the way to empowered uh, when it comes to that. And when the highest level of empowerment also brings up the highest level of trust. And last thing I'll say about trust in that respect, it's very, very hard to build. It's super easy to break. So it's, it's very, very fragile. And they could be doing incredible consultations and you know, getting that feedback out there and closing the feedback loop with one instance of a public safety issue or, you know, trash not being picked up for a week or something, we see how the trust plummeted, plummets, and then needs to be picked up again. Um, there is an ongoing debate about digital identity. And um, there's, <clears throat> let's see, you know, what I think some of the, one of the possibilities is to have a national level initiative. The Estonian government has a national digital identity card that every Estonian has issued. 
Canadian government is moving in this direction, I think that some kind of national digital identity is probably going to be the final solution that is really broadly trusted. In the interim, there are private market solutions that are gaining popularity. I mentioned this new Web3 space. There are some interesting new um, digital identity protocols that are emerging out of that space. Our approach is actually um, very low threshold. So when we do a public consultation process, we make it possible for people to participate without providing any personal information. There's no login, there's no sign up. People, anyone can land on the platform and start engaging in the participation. Usually, well, in many cases, cities will hire us to do public engagement. So we will do social media advertisements or mail drops or, you know, bulletin, um, what they, posters, um, sometimes calling campaigns to get a large number of people to come to the platform. As we're doing this, we monitor the demographic profile of the participants and we can refocus our marketing campaign to make sure that underrepresented people are being, being out, reached out to. So you may say, well, how do you know that these are real? You know, because you didn't verify people at the front end. So what we do is called passive authentication. We monitor the type of the way that people are engaging the platform and we look at IP addresses. We do device fingerprinting. There's a lot of data that we gather kind of quietly to put a risk assessment next to each um, account to determine if this is likely a person or likely not person. It's a percentages game for us. We're trying to find something that is very close to real, but not necessarily 100%. Sometimes there are campaigns to undermine the results, but because our, our algorithms are quite good, we can usually pick this out and we can remove that information from the data set and clean the data. So our security is, is on the back end rather than on the front end. So what I, I'm going to stand up because I'm short. Um, what, what, having the DIAC, for example, the Digital Identity Authentication Council of Canada's endorsement was a step. It's third party endorsement helps. Things like the B Corp endorsement and governance help. Things like the Salonian Democracies uh, Awards, those things help because they, they demonstrate that we have trust and that we've also gone through a lot of rigor uh, to get to, to this point. Um, as I mentioned, I've been, I was on city council for four years and I watched that. I felt like I walked around with a target on my back, to be honest with you, because of the toxicity that is going on in the political realm. Um, I sat through over 250 public hearings where the decisions were foregone conclusions. The public would show up in the derided public hearings um, and they were not listened to at all because the staff decisions were driving it and council were going along with basically what they were told to do. Um, then online, how, you know, I said earlier on, we're supposed to as electeds to reflect back on the feedback that we get from our residents. Well, how do we know their residents when there's troll infested waters out there? And there are, we get, we are on the receiving end of email generators, um, everything that you can think of, every organization, there are lobbying companies, there are troll farms, there are all of these different organizations and entities that are out there trying to create the impression of a false majority to skew the results. And so uh, this is why I think we need to make it real. We can't just um, do it in the back end. And of course we check IP addresses. That's all the, that's all the really basic stuff. But until we're willing to stand up and, and say, I, I am a resident, I am a constituent, I'm legitimate, and I should be able to provide my feedback in a democratic fashion and have it acted on, um, we will continue um, to be uh, prey to the, the larger agenda. And as we said earlier, the status quo does not want to be disrupted. Yes, um, thank you all for what you're doing. Um, so the citizens initiative process can be fr pretty frustrating and um, sadly very expensive. The idea is for citizens to 
to consult with other citizens and get their signatures on a petition so that a, an issue can be put on the ballot. But sadly, the hurdles are so high and the public is so wary of signing anything that most of the time, uh, I, I, I'm sure that's a fair, a fair assessment, uh, groups that want to put things on the ballot have to go out and hire paid signature gatherers. It's insane. So what is, should be fundamentally democratic becomes an issue of hiring people to do this chore. So um, I wonder if you could just give us a little update on the the uh, where we are with uh, digital signature gathering, um, are there are there good safe systems and and uh, are they being used anywhere? Wait, I get to answer questions. <laughs> um, actually, I've looked into that issue a little bit. Um, during the Luzerne uh, Forum for the Global uh, for this Forum, I asked the same question uh, because I done some research on the subject, and I found that it's very rare. Okay, uh, digital or online signature collection is very very rare. As we know, California, Switzerland are two places in the world that are the most advanced on ballot measure citizen initiatives. These two places don't have it, okay? And when, and, and that doesn't mean there are not people working to try to get it done. In California, I, I know a guy who's been working on this issue for decades, but the legislative branch wouldn't pass the law to approve it. Uh, so the only place in the United States is actually a little town called Boulder, Colorado that has a online petition collection system for initiative referendum. In, uh, uh, in Asia, the only one I know is in Taipei, and that has something to do with that, you know, to, to, get a, to get it done, okay? And uh, uh, in Europe, uh, there are a few countries, uh, not too many, I understand something in Italy, um, and Estonia is, is really a wonderful uh, place to, to, to uh, uh, they do everything, almost everything online, right? So, um, so th there are very, very few places. I think it's not a technical issue. The technology related is, is simple. Uh, it's, it's simply a political will. It's, uh, so uh, we hope to see more of it, but uh, I, I'm afraid it takes some time. You have something to, to add? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. You're right over there. So there's another question, Maureen. One of the um, frustrations I have with a lot of community engagements that are problem-based is that the solutions tend to increase effectiveness or efficiency, but they still reinforce the status quo when really we need to move to new territories of thinking because the status quo is what got us into the problems we're in. So how, what's your experience with that and how do you frame experiences for people engaged in your work to get us to the, we're running out of time. It's so frustrating. I mean, I, again, I, I, the last four years I sp were a living hell on city council um, because just banging my head against the wall because, and it all boils down to somebody was saying early power and money. It's, it's land power and money when it comes to local government. 
And uh, I, I just think that we're, that, you know, it, you can't just be doing petitions or trying to mobilize communities because you're just going to hit the wall of local government if, if we're talking at that level. Um, that's why in design, taking the design approach I did, I started with, with the, with the local government. They've got to commission it in the first place or they're not going to accept the outcomes in, in any event. Uh, so it, it, the feedback loop that I think we all agree on is, is essential, but the innovation is only going to come from people that, that care. It's, it's not people, especially staff and government. My experience is they're just covering, they just covering their jobs. They don't want to rock the boat. And so it's, it, it's uh, really tricky to try and create an, an environment that will allow for change. But we have to think outside of the box or we're just, you know, it's the definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different outcome, right? Yeah, well, I've been doing this for more than 10 years now, so, but I'm still trying. You gotta be, you, I think everybody here at this conference is ready to speak truth to power. That's something we all have in common. Um, I'd like to thank you all. Uh, it's been interesting to see the differences between your, your platforms. Um, but I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think something that they're all in common is that they essentially, the model is to partner with council or entity or whatever it is, and uh, you're helping them um, solve their problem. It's not so much a citizen empowerment tool. It doesn't start from the bottom, but they initiate things um, on your platforms and sort of force um, upwards um, change. Is that is that right or can, can, we, can you? Well, I'm gonna jump in and yeah. I don't want me to dominate this, but um, we, you need a business model in the first place for this. And all the two-sided markets are so, like social media, for example, or advertising driven. And advertising sells your eyeballs and interferes with our privacy policies, right? So. You know, we, I think all of, of, of us have settled on software as a service, as a model. So the client side becomes whatever level of government or agency. Um, but what I'm trying to do with PlaySpeak with the citizen-centered model is to enable both. We both have the, the government asking the people, and then we have people within the neighborhoods, within the civic network, talking amongst themselves. And that's why um, we got the the honorable mention and, and the Salonian Awards, because by doing the automated place-based notifications, it invites the public to, to come back and, and then petition City Hall about what they wanna see happening in their neighborhoods. And as I continue to develop this next phase in the project, it's gonna be very much more focused on the individual within a, the civic networking context. So I think, um, so I'm not just looking at building tools for government, but I think you need to have both working in tandem to make a successful model. So that, um, I, I agree with the colleague mentioned. We, in the SaaS model, yes, you need to have, um, in this case, an organization purchasing our services. But what we tend to see is, specifically with the organic part of our um, tool that collects organic feedback from online sources, many times we're able to sort of predict issues that residents um, that residents have. So rather than the government responding to something, they're being they're able to be proactive about an issue that has come up on social media and take action before it comes up. So it's it's either through that or through an idea that comes on an idea board for a topic as general as affordable housing or bike lanes or trash pickup. So it's the the primary um, um, organization we serve as local government, but the issues that we address are driven by residents' needs and priorities. I think the last two questions really identify the challenge in the space. You know, the local governments are the ones that are paying, and they do control to a certain extent the agenda and the questions that get put. And they're very conservative, you know, and they're operating in a power structure that is really driven by elections. And and so that is honestly a challenge in the space, you know. And I know that in Europe there are some platforms that are very ground up, and they do have political influence. I haven't seen so much of that in North America. We work not just with local governments, with you know other types of organizations as well. So in some cases, we have been retained by nonprofit organizations 
that have an issue that they want to advance. So for example, we work for a nonprofit coalition called um, Disability Without Poverty. And they use our platform to develop, a, I say a policy platform around a universal basic income for people with disabilities. So they use the group decision technology to lobby government. So in that case, we worked outside the government, but still we work for somebody. You know, they, we did have someone that paid for our fees and it was a nonprofit in that case, trying to influence a government body. But yeah, it's one of the challenges. Do you understand my, my, my point though, is that you're, you know, you are compromised when you work with the council, often community consultation means tick a box and you, 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 you and I know that you're doing a better job than that, but, um, you know, your answer, um, Colleen was that you'll be notified about other issues in your area. Your answer was that if people are chatting about it online, maybe the council might pick it up as an issue for themselves. Um, yours was that a non-for-profit might pick us up to push a certain issue, but none of them particularly are, are from the individual um, upwards. You know, there's, there's no way for an individual to simply say, I'm going to go on this platform, I'm going to raise this issue, and then it's going to um, gather support and, uh, you know, we're going to make informed sort of decisions. Entirely. So the, what I was showing you earlier, and I didn't really have much time, is if there's a specific project on a specific issue that's general, but right, the city wants to get um, feedback on an affordable housing plan, a one person idea that starts on that thread and picks up by other residents that comment or the city reacting to it would has a chance and we've seen that happen with some projects that we've done you can check our website yeah the, um yes i'll just finish the the rationale of it that does allow for that one specific person and their idea to be to be um to be promoted yeah I just want to let, to your point, I, there, we had a very controversial issue in Vancouver. The city put a, a, a survey on their site. They had 35,000 responses, I think more than ever before. At the same time, citizens did a change.org petition. Same thing, they had tens of thousands of responses. Staff got a hold of all of that. Council looked at it. And do you know what they decided to do? hire a consultant to do a standalone um, a survey with equity seeking groups. So it's a, this is the wicked problem that faces us. And I think I still think that there's a way to be doing this that is generating, but it's got to be done in such a way that that is going to be legitimate. Um, I still question social media as being a mechanism to do that because I've seen it so manipulated. Um, but it, that is that is, I think, one of the most wicked problems we face. I'll just say, make one more comment, and that I didn't get into this business to serve local governments. You know, it's their business model that we're, that has kept us alive, but really the vision I think that's probably motivating all of us is a new kind of democracy that's digitally enabled, where we're not really held hostage to these annual four-year elections where people are appointed as mayor and council who get to decide at that point, whether they're going to listen to citizens or not. So, you know, I think your criticisms are on point, honestly, but that's not the system that we're trying to build. We're trying to go beyond that to something that can really align much more, I think, with what you're dreaming of, so. Hi there. Um, my name is Olaf Brett from Notnagel. I um, worked with an organization called Lowercase D in New York City to um, uh, get more direct democracy rights there. Um, we didn't get that far, but um, what that work um, highlighted for me uh, and what the question you asked also and what your responses all highlight for me is really um, what I um, am most interested in um, advancing uh, in participating in this conference is uh, modernizing the right of initiative. In places that have initiative rights, we need to open those processes up using the technology we have to make 
the entire process from the conception, the drafting, the qualification to get on the ballot, the deliberation, the vetting of the evidence, all of this stuff that would mitigate you know, the failure of, uh, particularly in the United States anyway, of our representatives to provide a democratic public sphere. Um, but uh, I beg your pardon. Yes, that would, the place to go at this point to, to, to show that we can do this is places that have initiative rights, using those initiative rights to modernize, it, to modernize those rights. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? I'm game. <laughs> I yeah. wish I lived in such a place. Looking, you know, looking for collaborators. But I also want to call out the sensitive area uh, banks. Uh, these kind of works takes uh, money. Assistance. Are you financially helping us feel that we can continue to trouble? Uh, uh, how, how do you make a living? I have enough clientele, support. Uh, how, how are you supported, whether from business or donations? So, I would be surprised if there's many companies in this space that are financially healthy. We're, we're doing it for the love of it. I'm, 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 are we? Yes. <laughs> you know, how you get your money is actually very interesting. So there was, was, and I say was, a company in this space called Bang the Table, right? And um, they took VC money. So there's ways that you can scale your technology, but depending upon the type of capital that you take, that will set your fate also. So now they've been absorbed by an even bigger company, and they're frankly, out of the game. They're not in the democracy game anymore. They're in, you know, municipal software game, right? And so, or the other way you can go is, well, I'm not taking the money at all, and then you die. So, you know, I, it was so interesting that Rosalind made those two criteria when she made the intro. They have to be doing something interesting, and they have to be still alive. <laughs> because so many, I tell you, this space, is littered with the corpses of idealistic people that had enough money to go for a few years and then died. Yeah. I can just add to, to that that um, the GovTech space financially is is actually not in a crisis. It is, and governments themselves are not in recession because they are, you know, they're they're funded by tax taxpayers' money and taxes keep flowing in. Um, so if you see private sector organizations laying off hundreds of employees uh, in the GovTech space, which we're all in, um, we're less affected. We, see, we don't see budgets getting slashed completely. It's actually the opposite. This is sort of the time for governments to catch up with their private sector counterparts in terms of the technolog technological gap. How do we, because residents expect services to be digital. We're not in the game anymore of having to go to city hall to pay taxes, to pay your water bill, et cetera, right? We're not there. And this is a time and the governments have the money, specifically in the US, they've been funded quite heavily post the pandemic. Um, and those organizations that know how to be, uh, to use that are, yeah, get that, get it. So I started with uh, innovation grants and I've done a lot of academic grants as well. Um, and we do have a software as a service model. And we're, we've survived, you know, I started down this path in 2011. Um, but what I can say with respect to the GovTech market is that it has become privatized for all intents and purposes. It is profit motivated. And, um, you know, that's one of the reasons that, that, I, that we became a B Corp. Uh, it, our objective was not to be, I wasn't trying to become Mark Zuckerberg or Elon Musk for government. We were trying to um, be disruptive in the name of, of making democracy real. And that's the, the big challenge because government is going to, and again, I can tell you, I just spent four years as an elected official. They are going to do, they're gonna go with the path of least resistance. They're not gonna do anything that is, is innovative and they're certainly
we, we like uh, direct democracy. That's what they say. Now, but my question is, what, uh, what would happen if, uh, if the government uh, was friendly to digitizing the, the system? Would you all go out of business? No, they digitize the system. It's not a question of whether it's digital or not. It's, to, it's a question of, of whether it's real. I mean, the government are using all different technologies now. There is, a, you know, as, as Rosalind pointed out, there's hundreds of companies that are, are developing digital tools for government. It's not a question of whether it's digital or not. It's whether it's real or not, because it allows you to manufacture consent. And that's my biggest concern with the existing models. Sorry, I, I didn't make it clear. I, I meant digitizing the collection of signatures for, for the initiative. I think if we look down the road, 100 years from now, 150 years from now, no, we will have a digital government. And there are not going to be a difference between private companies and government. It will be digital. And I think the path is going to probably be through open sourcing. You know, so as we're developing our models, you know, certain companies will evolve to have towards having open source models. And I think that I think the future of government is digital. How we get there, I'm not completely sure, um, but I think we will. I think it's inevitable. Yeah, yeah sure. maybe. <laughs> just, just to add to that, I think operating with government is 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 tough because you need to transform from transform yourself from being a nice to have tool to be becoming a must have tool. This was specifically evident. I'm assuming we can all test to that just around COVID. When COVID hit. We were, okay, well, what's going to happen? Governments are now dealing with the biggest crisis that they've probably known over the last 100 years. Will they have time to sit on a demo and listen to us? Will our clients, will they need us to, to, to run through the pandemic? And we had a clear mission for our team to, to be on the COVID pile, right? Because everything else was swept away. If it wasn't about COVID, don't deal with it now. And we found and we also adapted our solution to make sure that it actually answers a real need in times of crisis, but also on a day-to-day -day basis uh, when you work with government. And I think that's, that's, that's sort of a, a, a rule to success long-term in this type of market. Anyone else have questions? Then uh, I would like to call the session to a close and thank the panelists with applause for the, and thank yourselves for participating. I, I personally learned a lot. Let's go to party. <laughs>